thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is the first of our issues oriented campaign trainings that we're doing for the Green Socialist Organizing Projects Education Committee. Um, today we're going to have Howie Hawkins, the original Green New Dealer, on to talk about uh, the Green New Deal as a, a policy, a keystone policy for green candidates. Uh, one of our goals in doing these issue oriented campaign trainings is to provide a basic foundation for Greens to talk about these policies um, and to hopefully start to uh, develop a common language that uh, Greens across the country are using in talking about things like the Green New Deal um, and other issues. So uh, today is Howie Hawkins on the Green New Deal. Um, next month, we've got Garrett Wasserman doing a training on uh, petitioning. And then Margaret Flowers doing a training on um, Medicare for All. Garrett will be on the 8th, May 8th at 3 p.m. And Margaret will be on May 22nd at 3 p.m. And then in June, we have a media and social media uh, workshop by myself and AJ Reed from Illinois. Um, that'll be on June 5th at 7 p.m. And then on June 26th at 3 p.m., we're gonna have Matthew Ho, uh, U.S. Senate candidate from North Carolina, on to talk about peace and anti-imperialism. Um, we hope to continue scheduling out trainings for at least a couple months past that, um, but the first three months of our campaign trainings are um, up and ready to be registered for the Zoom calls. Uh, you can go to greensocialist.net slash campaign dash trainings uh, to see what all to see the schedule and to register. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Howie to talk about the Green New Deal. Well, thank you, Chris. What I'd like to do is uh, put the Green New Deal in its historical context and then talk about the content and the ways we can campaign around it as Green Party candidates. Now, the Green Party's Green New Deal, as we conceived it here in New York, we were the first to run on it in 2010. It was an eco-socialist program. It was about meeting everyone's basic needs. And we talked about an economic bill of rights within the boundaries of ecological sustainability. And the big part of the program was a, a large investment in a rapid transition to 100% clean energy and zero greenhouse gas emissions. And when we put this forward, it was 2010, we're coming out of the Great Recession. New York State, where we were, was in a fiscal crisis, and Governor Cuomo was running as an austerity candidate, the Republican is an even more extreme austerity candidate. And so sometimes we call this the Hawkins Prosperity Plan versus the Cuomo Austerity Plan. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of a Green New Deal, some Greens were reluctant to uh, use that slogan because it, you know, it came from the New Deal, which was associated with the Democrats. But, you know, I persuaded them that, you know, what we're talking about is things that a lot of, you know, rank and file Democratic voters, progressives think the Democrats actually stand for it. They haven't for 50 years, but, uh, you know, it would appeal to them and, and put a green spin on it, since, hence the Green New Deal. And it really caught on. Uh, we had a slate of six candidates, two U.S. Senate candidates, uh, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, and Comptroller. And uh, then it was picked up by Greens around the country. And by August, we had a statement uh, by nearly 100 Green candidates around the country about a federal Green New Deal. And this became our signature issue in the 2010s. Uh, Jill Stein, our presidential candidate, she ran on the theme of a Green New Deal for America in both 2012 and 2016. But when we, when we came around to 2020 and I got nominated to be the presidential candidate for the Green Party, uh, we decided to emphasize that this was an eco-socialist Green New Deal because progressive Democrats had co-opted the slogan and watered down the program pretty radically. And you know, we had always emphasized that the public sector was going to have to be the central driver 
to the solutions to these twin crises of climate and economic insecurity. And you know, we like to point to the precedents of World War II. To address that emergency, the federal government took control of a quarter of the manufacturing capacity of the United States in order to turn industry on a dime into what FDR called the arsenal of democracy, to arm the allies to defeat the fascists. And we're arguing that we need to do nothing less through the public sector to defeat climate change and poverty. So the progressive Democrats in uh, 2018, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, won an upset primary victory. Uh, she did use the Green New Deal. We happen to know she got it from a uh, candidate who had run as a Green uh, for city council in New York. And his campaign manager was AOC's campaign manager. So that's where the slogan came from. And that's fine. And then AOC went to the Sunrise Movement sit-in at Nancy Pelosi's office right after the election. And they were demanding a special uh, Green New Deal committee that could put proposals to the floor of the House and really move this thing. And Pelosi, of course, said no. She rejected that. It would have to go through regular order, which meant the Energy and Commerce Committee in particular, which is controlled by fossil fueled Democrats. That's where they get a lot of their campaign contributions. And that's why we have such a terrible uh, energy policy with respect to climate change coming from the Democrats. So what AOC and Senator Ed Markey decided to do was put a non-binding resolution into the Congress uh, and try to get them to you know, give a sense of the Congress that that's where they wanted to go. The problem was they radically diluted what the Green Party had been talking about. Um, they eliminated the ban on fracking and new fossil fuel infrastructure. They eliminated the phase out of nuclear power. They eliminated the deep cuts in military spending to help pay for a Green New Deal. And they extended the deadline for zero emissions 20 years, two decades, from 2030 to 2050, which is beyond what the climate science says we need to do. And then they defined it as not zero emissions, but net zero emissions, which is what the fossil fuel industry loves, because the idea there is you keep burning fossil fuels, but phony solutions like carbon offsets and carbon capture and storage means you'll get, quote unquote, net zero. And then I think just as significantly, the progressive Democrats uh, basically changed it to, from an uh, eco-socialist program emphasizing the public sector into a Keynesian stimulus with corporate welfare for corporations, incentives, tax breaks, loan guarantees, subsidies, uh, to try to coax the corporations to make this energy transition. And also they assume that the economic stimulus of, of this these public subsidies would uh, trickle down to the working people in, in disadvantaged communities. And you know, we know from history, we've had a lot of history of that in our country, that that's not what happens. Um, so they're putting their hopes on the independent separate decisions of hundreds of corporations in response to these incentives to coordinate a transition to clean energy. And uh, they assume just like supply side trickle down economics, you know, from the Reaganites, assumes that the benefits are gonna trickle down uh, to the working people in the disadvantaged communities. Um, and we're arguing that, you know, we need to get back, and we did some of this during the old New Deal, where government uh, through public enterprises directly employed people providing goods and services that are essential, like clean energy or healthcare. And, by doing it through the public sector, you can also make sure that the public expenditures directly benefit uh, working people. But instead, you know, as, as the Green New Deal uh, has really been dropped from the vocabulary by, the, by most of the Democrats, and they got behind uh, Joe Biden's Build Back Better program. Uh, and when I say progressive Democrats, I'm talking about those in office, but also those out of office in the NGOs that uh, give a lot of support to these Democrats. Um, so, you know, two examples of, of how this was changed. One was, there was a lot of talk uh, going into the Build Back Better. And in fact, it was in Biden's first uh, American Jobs Plan, his first uh, basically climate action program, 
uh, to have mandated uh, renewable portfolio standards, which would require uh, power utilities to reduce their emissions or be fined. Uh, and they were proposing 4% a year in that proposal. And by the time it came out the other end of Build Back Better, it was a uh, clean energy standard, incentives, uh, no punishment if you don't meet the carbon uh, reduction emissions. And they included as clean energy, a lot of things that aren't like nuclear power, like uh, biogas and other biofuels, like waste incinerators, uh, like fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage attached to it. Um, but the, the basic problem was they switched from a, uh, basically a mandated program and a plan to get there for reducing carbon emissions to incentives to try to coax all these different corporations with all their separate decisions to make it happen. Um, another example is uh, the Civilian Climate Corps. Now the old Civilian Conservation Corps from the New Deal, that was an independent public agency that planned the projects around the country in a coordinated way and then directly hired people to make those projects happen. But what we're getting with the Civilian Conservation Corps is they're pri they privatized. It. They're gonna run it through AmeriCorps, uh, which will put out grant, you know, requests for proposals and private entities will, you know, put in their proposals and, and the uh, AmeriCorps will, you know, give the grants out, but it won't be coordinated. And, you know, there's some uh, labor standards, but uh, it's just not clear that uh, the benefits will go to the people that need it most, which is one of the purposes of that Civilian Climate Corps, particularly because there, you have to have a whole army of, you know, middle-class bureaucrats handling all this paperwork, dealing with the grants, giving out the money, monitoring it. It uh, just adds a whole nother layer of expense. And I will give the Sunrise Movement credit. They are about the only uh, group out there that got more money by the time we got the Build Back Better from the American, from the original Biden American uh, jobs plan. They got a raise from 15 billion to 45 billion for this civilian climate corps. But they've made no criticism of the fact that this is not like the old civilian conservation corps where it's a government agency and public employees that it's been privatized. So that's why it's important that we now, I think, talk about an eco-socialist Green New Deal so we don't get mixed up with what the Democrats are doing. And then, you know, what happened to their non-binding Green New Deal resolution was Pelosi never let them vote on it in the House. Now, McConnell, when he was the leader, did want the Democrats to go on the record about a Green New Deal because the Republicans were, you know, saying a whole lot of crazy stuff about the Green New Deal. It wasn't really true, but, uh, you know, the Democrats wanted to avoid that label. So the Democrats called it a trick. Schumer and Markey called this a trick by McConnell. So when the vote came up, uh, McConnell and uh, Schumer said, a vote abstain. And all the nice little, you know, obedient Democrats did except four of them voted with the Republicans no on this watered down by non-binding resolution. Uh, now, and we, we can give credit to Sunrise and, and AOC. The Green New Deal was a term of debate early in the Democratic part, presidential primaries. But in the end, only Bernie Sanders really had a serious program. His was actually 16.3 trillion over 10 years. That compares to the budget we came up with, I'll talk about in a little bit, that is uh, basically 41 trillion, counting the Economic Bill of Rights, or 27.8 trillion or half point five trillion for the energy transformation. And he, he had a big role for uh, public power. So that was to the good. Um, but all the other uh, Democrats, you know, they were putting out less than a trillion over 10 years in, in public money. And you know, some of them said it would stimulate a few trillion in private investment, but they were not serious plans. And you know, most of them ran away from it, like, like Joe Biden himself did when Trump attacked the Green New Deal and debates and Joe Biden said, it's not my plan. And uh, so the Green New Deal has been pretty much abandoned by all but the most, uh, the left wing fringe of the Democrats, basically the squad and a few others. Um, so we wanna emphasize this eco-socialist approach that emphasizes public ownership and democratic planning to make sure we can do a coordinated transition to clean energy and that the benefits 
from all this activity are equitably shared. So we came up with a budget during the presidential campaign, which uh, I will put into the chat here. And uh, as I said, it's a $41.7 trillion program over 10 years. And its goal is to get to zero and then negative emissions and 100% clean energy in a decade. We said by 2030, here we are 2022. Um, so we're saying a decade now. And it meets the basic needs of all, makes this energy transition. And we also estimated how many jobs. And we just used existing technology, their costs and the jobs created per dollar amount invested. And we came up with, for the whole program, 38 million jobs would be created, including 8.7 million in manufacturing. Um, which has been something that a lot of people, and I agree, uh, we agree, have said we need to, you know, rebuild our manufacturing so we aren't dependent on supply chains from places like China, like we found out during the COVID crisis. And we're now finding out in terms of uh, components and rare earth minerals and so forth for the uh, solar energy. Um, so this 41.7 trillion was broken down into 27 and a half trillion over 10 years. We call it the Green Economy Reconstruction Program to get to zero emissions and 100% clean energy. And that part created 30.5 million jobs, including 8.5 million in manufacturing. That's where most of the manufacturing jobs would come from. The Economic Bill of Rights to end poverty and economic insecurity was guaranteeing the rights to a living wage job, an income above poverty through a guaranteed minimum income, affordable housing through a radical expansion of quality public housing uh, available to anybody um, so that everybody would have an affordable option and housing would be affordable, whether you were in the going to public housing or the, or the private market, because the private market would have to compete with that. Quality health care through a universal public health care system. And we're advocating not just national health insurance, but a national health service where uh, the hospitals and other assets of a health system are under democratic public control, which has become a bigger issue uh, you know, over the years because uh, the corporatization of the hospitals and, and, and uh, clinics. A quality health care, I'm sorry, lifelong public education uh, from child care and pre-K through college and uh, trade school at public colleges and trade schools, and a secure retirement through increased social security benefits. So we're talking about jobs, income, healthcare, housing, education, and retirement. And that program would create 7.6 million additional jobs, including 300,000 in manufacturing. Now, a lot of people say, wow, that's a big price tag. It would nearly double the federal budget. But our argument is that we need the, the public enterprise planning and coordination to transform all our productive systems to clean energy and zero emissions, not just power production, which gets most of the discussion, but also transportation, which is as big in terms of its carbon emissions, buildings, which are also big, manufacturing and agriculture. And we need this planning and coordination because we need to do things like link uh, transportation systems to new public housing so we can create walkable communities, which are more energy and resource efficient. That's part of a uh, creating an ecologically sustainable society. Uh, we need to phase in clean production systems, particularly in manufacturing, uh, without disrupting supply chains or making sure they have supply chains. And, and this is where the public enterprise comes in. If we don't take over public ownership of these key sectors, the power sector, the oil and gas sector, uh, the transportation sector, and at least a big part of the banking sector, um, these companies are gonna keep using their carbon emitting production systems for their whole projected lifespan. And that'll be too late because a lot of these uh, production systems still have decades to go and we gotta get off of a carbonized economy. Another part of the Green New Deal, and this is something that we really need to emphasize because you know, even if the United States adopted a domestic Green New Deal, uh, the global situation is uh, if the rest of the world doesn't also do that, we're screwed from climate catastrophe. 
So our Eco Socialist Green New Deal budget had a trillion dollars over the 10 years for a global Green New Deal. And that was basically fully funding the UN's Green Climate Fund, which was created in 2010. And it's supposed to have, was a, had a goal of uh, $100 billion a year by 2020. And in fact, the cumulative investment in that Green Climate Fund over that now 12 years since it was initiated is only 10 billion. I mean, this is pathetic. Uh, there is just no help uh, from the countries like the United States that historically made most of the emissions to mitigate the damage and loss already being suffered, particularly by the poor countries um, in the global South and to finance their transition to uh, a clean energy system. And, you know, if the U.S. was to contribute its fair share, the U.S. Climate Action Network, uh, a lot of their groups did some research uh, as we were approaching the last uh, uh, U.N. climate conference in Glasgow. And, you know, they noted that according to the International Panel on Climate Change, we need 50 percent reduction in uh, emissions by 2030 to just have a 50-50 chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a threshold for uh, that's still possible if we move immediately and beyond which it, it gets pretty disastrous. Um, so sometimes it's called climate reparations. So what they said for the U.S. to contribute its fair share, we wouldn't have to uh, reduce 50 percent, we'd have to reduce 195 percent. Now, of course, we can't do that with domestic emissions. They said 70 percent domestic emissions cuts by 2030 and then 125 percent of our current emissions in international emissions reductions uh, through US financial and technological aid to these countries in the global south. Um, that is what we should be doing for a global Green New Deal. And this climate reparations program is not even on the agenda unless the Green Party puts it there. So let me say a few words about just a few of the components of the Green New Deal with respect to manufacturing. Um, we need to replace particularly uh, steel and chemicals and cement production, which are very carbon intensive, with uh, carbon free technologies. That means in the steel industry, replacing coke ovens with electric arc furnaces that can remanufacture scrap steel, and then using green hydrogen for blast furnaces instead of coke ovens. Now, the industry is already moving toward electric arc furnaces for the scrap metal but they're not gonna do that any faster than their coke ovens wear out. So there's a case for public ownership and planning to make that happen on the time scale we need. And then cement is dependent on your source, but it's like six to 8% of the world's carbon footprint because calcium carbonate hardens the cement. Then when it's heated up, the calcium stays to harden, but the carbonate, it's emitted as carbon dioxide. And that's where we get this big emission. So there are cement, uh, uh, carbon-free cement technologies. And again, this is a case where uh, they're not gonna be built until the old uh, systems wear out unless we do it through the public sector. Um, and you can go through the different manufacturing sectors, uh, even the renewable energy sectors, and you gotta coordinate uh, the supply, the parts to the final assembly and manufacturing um, and if you leave that to independent corporations to decide on their own, it, it probably won't be coordinated. The market is too slow to make the adjustments that we need at this time because we're, we're in an emergency. Uh, another example is housing and transportation and how we need to link them. Our Green New Deal budget called for 25 million units of new public housing uh, over the next decade to end the housing crisis and also contribute to creating these walkable communities, which are energy and resource efficient. Well, you got to coordinate that with trans, uh, planning your mass transit system so that the new housing and the transit are within walking distance and you create uh, compact, diverse communities. And that's part of the transition we need to make. And just to compare that with what was proposed in uh, the most uh, ambitious part of Biden's various proposals, uh, there are 120 million buildings in the country that need uh, retrofitting with heat pumps and efficiency and so forth. And Biden proposed doing 4 million 
in uh, four or five years. And just for efficiency, not heat pumps to replace the gas for cooking and heating and cooling. Well, at that rate, it would take 120 if it's four years or 150 years if it's five years to, for that 4 million building program. You know, that is just not a serious program. If it's gonna take you, you know, 120 to 150 years to retrofit our buildings for clean energy. And then I'm gonna skip a little discussion about agriculture. So we have time for question and answers, but you can ask me about that if we get to that. Um, so let's, let's try to wrap up so we get to the question and answer by talking about, okay, so I've been talking about a federal program, but we can do a lot with this at the state and local level as well. Um, I think we have to face the fact that the prospects for an eco-socialist Green New Deal from the Democrats we got now, let alone the Republicans, are zero. Um, so our focus in terms of our activities should be on uh, public organization and mobilization. Um, we've won the debate. I mean, all the polls about a Green New Deal show well over 60% of the people want one. Um, so, you know, we're not doing this with expectations that we're gonna get much from the people in office now, but we wanna lay the political basis and hopefully for getting Greens into the house. I think that's where we can get into Congress first. Um, so we need to organize and mobilize to translate the public opinion that's already with us into public power. So, you know, our candidates for the house and Senate uh, you know, should campaign on this federal equal social Green New Deal and challenge their opponents to uh, say yay or nay on, on the whole idea and, and the pieces of it and make it a real debate and show the people that, you know, the Green Party has got real solutions. Um, in terms of outside the electoral arena, there are a lot of fights going on, particularly to stop new fossil fuel infrastructure and to ban fracking. And we've been winning some of these, like we did get Keystone stopped. Uh, we have got others stopped. Um, we have a number of uh, big fights going on now, the Dakota Access Pipeline for the fracked oil from the Bakken field in North Dakota is still ongoing. Uh, big fights over Enbridge lines three and five through uh, Northern Minnesota and Michigan uh, and a little bit of Wisconsin. That's tar sands from, you know, the Alberta tar sands. That's what uh, Bill McKibben famously called a climate bomb. Um, those fights are still going on. Big fight over the Mountain Valley gas pipeline from Northwest West Virginia to Southern Virginia. Um, we got a push from, for, a temp, or for a permanent rather than temporary ban on drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And we got these pipeline fights all over the world. I mean, there are indigenous Siberian people in Russia trying to stop, you know, their land in, from being, you know, gridded, networked with oil pipelines. Um, and, you know, it's very dangerous, but they are speaking up despite the repression there. And we, I just heard about a proposed 900 mile oil pipeline from Uganda to Tanzania. So, you know, the first thing we got to do is stop building this infrastructure because the corporations, once they build it, they want to, you know, make money off it for three or four decades. And that just locks us into climate catastrophe. And then in terms of local and state action, um, what we can do is propose that our uh, states and our municipalities, our counties, uh, have a plan to get to zero emissions and 100% clean energy. And uh, we can't fund that all with the tax resources we have at the local and state level. So we should figure out what we can fund. And that comes in, that brings up the issue of progressive taxation, but also uh, then we, what we demand from the federal government so we can make this transition at the local and state level. I think a big thing we should be demanding is public power, municipal power utilities, or a state public energy system or combination of federation of municipal public power uh, districts federated at the state level for statewide coordination. Because then we'll have the power to choose renewables and to uh, mothball the old carbonized uh, generation plants and to build the uh, smart grid we need for the distributed nature of wind and solar 
and other distributed renewable energy sources. You know, if we don't have that, then the, the utilities are just going to keep using their old servo mechanical grids built around centralized power plants, you know, coal, more gas now, as well as nuclear. Um, we can demand public microgrids uh, through this public uh, energy system in, in neighborhoods. Um, we should push for the public power agencies as well as public banks to finance retrofitting our buildings because people can't, most people can't afford up front to you know, put in heat pumps, uh, efficient appliances, you know, like uh, convection uh, ovens and induction stoves that are uh, electrified, uh, solar panels and micro wind where it's appropriate. But by financing this upfront, the people that take the loans out can pay them off because once you've got these renewable and efficient uh, retrofits of your buildings, you don't have fuel costs every month. You don't have to pay for that gas or that, that uh, heating oil. Um, and that difference enables uh, the consumer, whether it's a household or a small business, to pay those loans back. Um, and that's got to be done if we're going to make this transition uh, in our buildings, because most people can't afford the upfront costs. Uh, net metering is another policy, so that if you're producing energy, uh, the utility has to pay you for it uh, at the same rate you pay them when, when you uh, pull power off the grid. Um, so we, need, we should be pushing for municipal and state Green New Deals. And then uh, the last thing, which I think is something that uh, is a very focused and good demand is, you know, most municipal uh, governments have planning boards or agencies, but the way most of them operate is they just sit back and wait for private developers to come up with proposals, which they generally rubber stamp because the real estate industry runs most municipal governments. We need to flip that on them and make the planning board or the planning agency, or maybe we need to transform the planning board into a planning agency that makes the plans that we wanna implement and then bids out to construction firms to build those plans. And I think that's an area where once you get on in fighting the planning board, you're getting into a whole lot of issues related to the Green New Deal with respect to uh, uh, affordable housing, uh, desegregation of housing, which also means schools. I mean, there's just a whole lot of issues that uh, we've left planning pretty much neglected. The left at the local level has not really dealt with that. So those are some ideas on how you can uh, push the Green New Deal forward at the local level. And I'll just wrap up by saying what you already know, we're in a climate emergency. The International Panel of Climate Change's sixth assessment report says we have to peak greenhouse gas emissions by 2025 to have a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in global temperatures. It's just a thousand days from now. Uh, we have a study out from Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research in the UK, who is one of the world's foremost uh, climate scientists and has been a better predictor than the International Panel on Climate Change on how fast this crisis is accelerating. That's partly because he does good research. It's partly because the International Panel on Climate Change has to get their reports approved by the nations of the world before they're released, which includes you know, petro states like Saudi Arabia and Russia and the United States. So uh, their conclusions tend to get watered down, particularly in terms of their policy recommendations, but also their predictions of, of how fast things are going downhill. But what Kevin Anderson's research, and you can look this up, it came out, it's called Path, Renewable Pathways, I think. Um, he said the rich countries have to cut emissions by 70% by 2030 and 100% by 2030 to have a chance of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we're running out of time. And if we stay on the business as usual pathway, we're headed for three degrees Celsius rise, or it's about five and a half degrees Fahrenheit height by the end of the century. And that takes us back millions of years to climates that uh, uh, it'll be hard for humans to survive in because beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius lies 
growing regions of the world that become too hot for human habitation. It means mass species extinctions, which means the collapse of ecosystems, which means the collapse of much of our agriculture, which means mass starvations and hundreds of millions of climate refugees. By 2050, that's what a lot of these studies are saying. So real solutions can't wait. Of course, the Democrats and the Republicans are not providing them, so it's up to the Green Party to advance this eco-socialist Green New Deal. So I'll stop there and uh, take questions. Well, while waiting for questions, maybe I'll go back and say a few words about agriculture, which doesn't get a lot of attention, but uh, it should because not only uh, does it right now, agriculture emit carbon, you know, with fuels and fertilizers and so forth, uh, but the soil is dying and the soil is, you know, when it's living soil rather than, you know, dead soil with chemicalized agriculture, pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, it traps a lot of carbon. So it's part of drawing carbon out of the atmosphere as well as stopping putting it in there. So our Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, uh, first of all, we wanted to ban absentee-owned corporate farming and just have working farmers on the land, uh, on their own land. Uh, we wanna make sure they earn a, a living income and that uh, means a program of parity, parity pricing and supply management so that they uh, do get a return on uh, their crops that you know, covers their costs and gives them an income they can live on. Uh, we need to provide subsidies and technical assistance as farms phase out biocides and transition back to organic agriculture. Uh, most studies say we need about a million more farmers to you know, go to this kind of regenerative organic agriculture. So we need a new Homestead Act uh, that, and, and a technical training program to help these farmers, these new farmers, uh, get on the land. And we do have a lot of people coming to this country from Central America who were farmers. And I've worked with them in upstate New York. You know, they've had their farm workers now, but their dream is to become a farmer here. You know, so the farmers, the people that, you know, could do this are here. Um, so, you know, that's a part of the Green New Deal that uh, I haven't seen any legislation. The, the progressive Democrats have some partial programs. There's a Green New Deal for public schools and a Green New Deal for public housing. And these are bills that would basically uh, retrofit our schools and our public housing for clean energy, which is, you know, good as far as it goes. It's just not going far enough. Do you see KJ's question? Uh, no, I, I had There's never... talk about electric cars being enforced. Would this be possibly included with the Green New Deal? Yeah, most programs in some states have adopted it. They have a, a date by which no more internal combustion engines will be sold in the state. And I forget what we put in our eco socialist Green New Deal the year 2025 comes to mind. I think Massachusetts and California already have that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how you make these transitions. You don't just, and this is what's left and what was left of Build Back Better. Uh, you know, there'd be some public subsidies for charging stations and then some rebates for consumers to buy electric vehicles, but no uh, date by which no more electric uh, internal combustion engines could be sold. So, uh, that should be part of the Green New Deal. And uh, the other thing I'd say about that is there's, and this was again in Build Back Better and the Biden policies, a big emphasis on electrifying uh, trucking and personal vehicles, as opposed to moving a lot of people off the roads and onto the rails and a lot of freight off the roads and onto the rails. So freight rails, instead of these 18 wheelers, are moving most of the heavy freight. And then when it, you know, going from the rail station to the warehouse and from the warehouse to the 
consumer or the business, the products uh, would be uh, delivered by smaller electric vehicles, you know, electric trucks, rather than these, you know, big diesel trucks. Um, and that way, and, and, and another consideration there is all the resources that go into vehicles. Um, you know, they're very electronic. That's where you get into the shortages or the difficulties of uh, getting rare earth minerals, you know, like cobalt and uh, what's some of the others? Um, well, nickel, uh, copper, um, lithium, uh, you know, into these products. And, and uh, we're going to need a lot of that for solar energy, smart grid. Um, we don't want it squandered on, on the transportation sector more than it needs to be. So that's another reason that our a Green New Deal transportation policy should emphasize mass transit, uh, interurban rails, uh, and then high-speed rails for the longer uh, distances. So there's less uh, reliance on uh, air traffic, which is more difficult to eliminate the carbon from. Uh, there's a lot to be done there. And so, you know, the emphasis strictly on electric vehicles, I think, is in this place. And we need a, we need a, a more rounded uh, transportation policy. Electric vehicles have their place. And uh, another thing we can think about is, uh, you know, making electric vehicles uh, something that people don't privately own, but is a public utility that you use when you need it. And, uh, you know, rent from the public utility. And meanwhile, if we have convenient and affordable or even free mass transit, uh, you're not going to need a vehicle for a lot of your uh, mobility. So it's a whole nother area where the Greens, you know, that's why we need to be in, in these elections, in office, in the movements, you know, making these points. Yeah, one thing I want to comment on was when you talked about getting involved and pushing, you know, your local boards and stuff. Um, and that's essential with the public utilities too. Um, we have a public power provider in my town, um, but 10, 15 years ago when one of their boilers literally blew up, um, it was a big deal. Um, massive explosion at the plant and everything. The renewable energy wasn't on the table for the board. They just built a new boiler immediately. Um, you know, so just having the public utility You've got to have that engage the civic engagement to push them in this direction. Otherwise, they're just going to keep doing what they're comfortable with. Um, That's right. You know, democracy is no guarantee, but it gives us a fighting chance. And you can have public utilities that are more or less democratic. Um, the best uh, public energy system model I've seen came out of the 1970s when we were dealing with the Arab oil boycott and the spike in gasoline prices and high inflation. And it came from uh, uh, Lee Webb, who came out of SDS. He was an early SDSer. And uh, Jeff Foe, who's a progressive economist. I'm not sure what he's doing in the 60s. And they wrote this bill. It was for Vermont, but it got published in the congressional record. And what they provided for were public energy districts, like municipal utilities that were elected by the local community and the utility workers. Two thirds, uh, you know, the general public, one third the workers, so they have a say and their expertise was part of the board. And then they federated at the state level uh, to coordinate statewide planning. So you have a bottom up democratic planning system. Um, a lot of these uh, municipal utilities, you know, their boards or their, you know, executives are appointed by the mayor or the city council. So it's at one remove. Um, you can still have influence because you have influence in mayoral and city council elections, but uh, you know, it may be better to just directly elect these people so they can put their energy proposals out for the public to you know, vote for what they want. Um, <coughs> a contrary example is what the uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District did in the I think it was late 1970s, early 1980s, they had built a nuclear power plant called Rancho Seco. And then they decided they wanted to shut it down and go renewable. And they did, even though they invested all that money and owed all that money on the nuke. That's because the people had the power. So that's an example of where 
you know, democratic socialism, public ownership, democratic planning uh, gives us the power to make the right decisions. But of course, it's not guaranteed unless it just gives us a chance to, you know, make the right decision. <coughs> Well, while we're waiting for another question, um, I, I, I want to emphasize how bad the uh, Build Back Better program was, which, you know, the progressive Democrats got all enthusiastic about it, like it was a Green New Deal. And what it was really doing uh, was uh, fracking the hell out of the country for oil and gas. Um, there was nothing in it to stop that. Under the Biden administration, we uh, been giving out oil and gas permits at a faster rate than the Trump administration did. Uh, of course, now it's worse with the war in Ukraine and U.S. oil and gas companies looking to fill the European market and replace their oil and gas uh, or replace Russian oil and gas with U.S. Uh, sourced oil and gas. Um, so we're going the wrong direction there. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they included is clean energy. Uh, fossil fuel uh, power plants that had carbon capture and sequestration, a big push for nuclear power. I mean, even AOC said she's open to it. I don't think she knows much about it, but most of the plants we got should be retired. Uh, they were designed to last at most 40 years, and they've been getting extensions from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, which we used to call in the anti-nuclear movement, nobody really cares or Nuclear Rubber Stamp Commission. Um, they've been, had their lifetimes extended to 60 years and 80 years in a few cases, and now their proposals coming in for 100 years. And that's really dangerous because that radiation in brittle parts and plants. So they become more vulnerable to uh, breakdown. Um, and of course, they're uneconomical. We have subsidies in New York, in Ohio. Um, I guess in Ohio, they found out there was bribery involved in getting the bill passed, but they're, it's come back. So they're fighting over that. I think that's where that stands. I think New Jersey's got subsidies. And then they tried to build nukes in South Carolina and Georgia. And the ones in South Carolina had such cost overruns and construction delays, they just abandoned the project. They're still building two nukes at the Vogel, uh, where there already are two nukes at Vogel in, in Georgia. And the only reason that's happening, and they're throwing Good money after bad, huge cost overruns. The cost is now double what they planned. The plants are, you know, way over, uh, you know, the time when they were supposed to go online. Um, and the only reason they're doing that is uh, Governor Kemp beat Stacey Abrams, or she got the election stolen from her. And Kemp is a creature of Duke Power and the Southern Company. And so he's doing what his, you know, campaign donors are bidding. Um, so, I, you know, my basic point is uh, even with Build Back Better, which, uh, you know, the progressives were, you know, they made this terrible deal. And this is, I think, a mistake. They, uh, instead of going to the public and building support for a real Green New Deal, they said, uh, we will negotiate inside. They played the inside game. And they got out and negotiated. They got tricked. They didn't have the votes. There was always Manchin and Cinema and other more conservative Democratic senators behind them. And there were, you know, at least a dozen on the House side who never wanted these programs. And so they, they got the uh, infrastructure bill separated from the Build Back Better, which is more about the care economy. And uh, then they got stabbed in the back by these conservatives. Uh, so they didn't even get the limited climate programs, let alone the care programs that they bargained for. And, you know, that's the game they're playing now. They're still playing the inside game, the Congressional Progressive Caucus just endorsed the corporate Democrat who beat Nina Turner, the progressive who was a spokesperson for Bernie Sanders in Cleveland in a special election. Now they're uh, having a rematch and they're not supporting Nina Turner. And that's, you know, they're trying to accommodate to the more corporate Democrats who then accommodate to the extremist Republicans. I mean, we've seen that in, in the voting rights. They won't lift the filibuster to get uh, you know, the voting rights and election protection bills passed 
uh, to preempt what the Republicans are doing in about 20 states, which is suppress the ability of people to vote, particularly people of color, people likely to vote Democratic. And uh, they're taking over the administration of elections so they can steal damn elections. And the Democrats just seem to have rolled over for them. You know, they emphasize Build Back Better, not voting rights, didn't get the filibuster lifted, and now they got none of it because they keep trying to compromise with people that are <laughs> going to stab them in the back anyway. That's why we need an independent Green Party on the left that just sticks by gun, guns and, uh, you know, mobilizes, as I said earlier, the, the public sentiment that's already with us. I mean, there's a real opportunity there. We just got to stick with it. I think it's unfortunate that so many progressives feel when the election comes up, they got to settle for the lesser evil to stop the extremist Republicans, understandable, but they're not, you know, what do you get? You silence yourself. If you're for a Green New Deal and you vote for, you voted for Biden, you voted against the Green New Deal. If you wanted Medicare for all and you voted for Biden, you voted against Medicare for all and so forth. So you silenced yourself. So I think that's an argument that uh, we got to make to people who hesitate. And uh, I can't see the questions. So I'll, I'll keep talking if there are no more questions. Um, There's a couple. Okay. I wanted to say too, when you were talking about the costs of nuclear, in Illinois, you know, the Democrats are really patting themselves on the back for a climate bill that they passed uh, last year, but it's it provides two to three times more funding for nuclear bailouts than it actually does for renewable investments. Um, in Illinois, we've been, in the last um, less than a decade, we've put five billion into bailouts for our, and we don't have a lot of nuclear power plants, just a few, um, but we're constantly bailing them out on the state level. Um, so yeah. Um, KJ said, I also, I've also noticed that Joe Biden still supports fracking, which is bad for the environment. I'm in California where we have, where we have lots of nuclear power plants. And I, one thing I think would be interesting for you to kind of interject into that, how we is how Ukraine has seemed to even more ramp up our desire for domestic production. Domestic production, oil and gas, I talked about that. Um, also nuclear. I mean, there are a lot of people saying, you know, Germans should restart plants, they shut down. Um, you know, my argument is all the money you're going to spend doing that should go into renewables. Uh, Bill McKibben had a nice article, Heat Pumps for Peace and Freedom. You can get a lot more energy efficiency and uh, substitution of renewables for uh, oil and gas by investing in the renewables and the efficient technologies like heat pumps. Um, you know, wasting money on nuclear, as I, as I described those plants, particularly building new plants. Now the plants that are running and uh, are not, you know, really on the edge of falling apart, you know, they should be phased out as the renewables come on. I don't think we should just shut them down immediately without the renewables to replace that power because that'll be too disruptive to an economy that needs to keep functioning so we can build these renewables. Um, so, but you know, people keep coming forward with nuclear as an answer, and it's it's a diversion of particularly resources and time. We don't have time to build new nukes. You know, they take, you know, well over a decade to come online. They're having problems all over the world building them. Um, so that's just a, a false solution. Uh, Garrett said, how it seems like many activists today have been associated the Green New Deal with AOC and the Democrats. And so I've seen leftists that think that the Green New Deal is a neoliberal plan. What's the best way to get the message out about the eco-socialist Green New Deal? Do we need to hold more events, write our own books, reconsider rebranding? No, I think not rebranding because most of the Democrats have abandoned it. And as I discussed earlier, yeah, it's a neoliberal privatized approach to the energy transition based on uh, incentives to corporations, corporate welfare, loan guarantees, uh, grants, and uh, tax breaks. So uh, I think we just got to explain that. I think that's why, you know, in our presidential race, we called it a eco-socialist Green New Deal to distinguish from what the Democrats have done, watering it down, not just in terms of 
eliminating the ban on fracking, the new fossil fuel infrastructure, and the phase out of nuclear power, and the cuts in military spending, and the extension of the deadline for zero emissions by two decades. But also in terms of, you know, the Green Party's Green New Deal always emphasized doing the, cent the public sector being the driver of uh, the transition we need, because we need public ownership and planning uh, to coordinate all the things that got to happen to make this transition. And it's not going to be done with incentives to, you know, scores or hundreds of corporations making their own independent decisions about what's good for their own bottom line. Um, so, but I don't think we should abandon the Green New Deal uh, slogan. It's sort of been abandoned by the Democrats, um, except for the, you know, the squad and a few others on the left fringe of the Democratic Party. What we should be doing is basically educating them. I'm not sure when you came on, Gary, but, you know, I talked about the progressive Dems not just being those in office, but those NGOs that support them, like the Sunrise Movement. And I talked about how the Climate uh, Conservation Corps or the Civilian Climate Corps is very different from the New Deal's Civilian Conservation Corps. <coughs> it's privatized. They're going to run through Medicare. It's going to be grants to private entities. Unlike the Civilian Conservation Corps, the New Deal, which was a public agency with public employees implementing a coordinated plan of conservation. So I think uh, that's why we call it the Eco-Socialist Green New Deal. That's, that, we need that to distinguish us from what the uh, progressive Democrats are doing. 